Hello and welcome to today's virtual Coffee Talk webinar. My name is Margaret and I will be your host today. We have a few housekeeping announcements and then we will introduce our speakers. As a reminder, in order to earn CPE credit for today's session, please stay connected to the webcast for the entire program and participate by responding to at least three of the four interactive questions. Second, there will be a course evaluation which will open in a new window upon exiting the webcast at the end of the program. Finally, I will introduce our speakers for today. As always, we have Kevin Jacobs, Managing Director with Alvarez and Marcel Tax in Washington, DC, the National Tax Office Practice Leader. He brings more than 15 years of experience in tax matters in both the public and private sector. Joseph Boddicker is, a, is counsel in the Federal and International Tax Group. He focuses his practice on federal international tax and legislative and public and policy matters. Before joining Alston Bird, Joe served as a law clerk in the U.S. Tax Court and Tax Council for the U.S. Senate Finance Committee and to three U.S. Senators. Congressman Earl Pomeroy served as North Dakota's at-large U.S. representative from 1993 to 2011. And in 2011, joined Alston and Bird, where he works on the firm's legislative and public policy group. Finally, Nate Jones is a lead product manager with Walters Kluwer Tax and Accounting. He will be showing us today how to find additional answers and resources using CCH Answer Connect. Thank you all. Kevin, take it away. Great, thanks. And thanks everyone for joining. For those that um, successfully survived uh, yesterday's filing deadline, congratulations. Um, hopefully this presentation won't be as nerve wracking, except for the, the short answer is there's challenges abound, right? We, we know for a fact that nothing is really certain. Um, there is a lot of challenges that we have navigating this election. Uh, any poll you look at is going to say it's extremely close. It's neck and neck. You can look at all the, um, congressional races, you can look at what's happening in the White House. Everything is generally within the margin of error, and that causes the tax policies to be highly uncertain. Um, during this webinar, we're planning to share our thoughts on a host of topics, including the presidential candidates evolving tax policies, the implications it has on OECD, other potential interests, regulatory landscape, and more importantly, as Margaret noted, both Joe and Earl come from being in, in the swamp, as one of our presidential candidates refers to it. They were there actually at Congress trying to get things done. They can tell us from a practical standpoint what should be happening, what may be happening, and what should we anticipate. So why don't we kick off and say, how did we get here? And we put together this slide, just there's a lot here. Um, there's a lot that we're going to want to talk about. But when you look through the, the history, we all know, OK, TCGA passed. Why is it even on this slide? Well, guess what? In 2022, we started having the required R&D capitalization. We started having changes made to 163J. Um, 168K phase out begins uh, last year. And so you can see that there's a lot of things that are on the horizon. So even though there's a do nothing approach right now to TCGA, tax law changes will be had because it's springing provisions. Now, with that said, we can look at what's happened from a tax legislative standpoint. We've, we've seen some bills pass. Well, we've seen other large ones like the BBBA stall. Right. And so we can say, OK, well, what happened? We had the Inflation Reduction Act. We had chips. That's all helpful. Did it move the needle? What does it show? Can we possibly see signs that maybe we can have bipartisanship? Uh, it'll be interesting to, to hear what what Earl and Joe say. And, and on the back end, obviously, we need to be mindful of companies are, are multinational. And so not only do we have to think about what's happening domestically, but what are foreign politics are involved, but also more importantly for this group, foreign tax policy. And so we have the OECD and the pillar, two pillar agreement. Um, you could see the, the key dates that we have here. Um, the election is, is scheduled for November 5th. Uh, we have funding ex expiring December 20th. The debt limit is get reinstated. We have a new Congress. Uh, 
one of the questions that's always fascinating to talk about is not when is the election, but when do we think we'll actually have a definitive answer as to who won the presidency? Um, so stay tuned. I'm going to pose that to both Earl and Joe. They haven't seen it coming, but uh, we'll see where they are. But I guess, Earl, Joe, when you look at these dates, you see what's on the on the calendar. You see things of how we got here. What are you coming away with? What what are the tidbits that we should see even look before we look into our crystal ball? What's our takeaways? So we're going to let's just rotate to go who goes first. And so I'll take this one out to start and, and then you, you'll get the next one to start. We'll just rotate it like that. Uh, tax policy is largely a matter of budget reconciliation at this point in time. Tax policy is one of the priority policy areas uh, that either party uh, wants to get their hands on, uh, but they kind of fight it to a draw unless the, they get the, uh, the centers of power sufficient to run a budget reconciliation act. Now the budget reconciliation act was never developed to uh, basically uh, uh, fast track tax policy. It was, it was put in to basically bring order and discipline to the federal budget. <laughs> I think you can say that didn't work very well, uh, but it does continue to work well in terms of, I call it a get out of filibuster free card. So you don't have to have 60 votes in the Senate. Uh, you can pass something with 50 votes in the Senate, 51 uh, if you don't have the presidency. Uh, if you have the presidency too, you can have a, a, a 50 votes. And it's become, at least relative to what's before us, the the, the way you understand how we got where we are. Uh, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act will be will be front and center. Many expiring provisions in 20 at the end of 2025. Why in the world would you put in place things that are clearly to, you, you hope for is a forever tax policy and have it expire. Well, very simple reason. The cost you, 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 in the 10 year budget forecast, you have to you have to using the Budget Reconciliation Act stay within uh, cost margins that are uh, th there. And there's often more will than wallet. So they use the Budget Reconciliation Act and phase out uh, tax provisions that they think are so politically popular, the future Congress has to reinstate them and continue them anyway, but they don't get dinged for the cost of it while trying to, the full cost of it, while trying to pass a Budget Reconciliation Act. So that is why with the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act, you have, for example, the corporate side of the house, those are permanent. Uh, it's the personal tax uh, uh, rates and the, some of the things that are much more attractive broadly to the American people that uh, that expire because they think they'll have to continue them. And, uh, and you know, uh, if, if there is aligned control in the Republican Party, you're going to look at a, a continuation of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. It was uh, passed fairly quickly, this TCJA, and it was, it was built on uh, earlier work that uh, Chairman of Ways and Means Committee, Dave Camp, had invested in broad tax reform he never was able to pass it while he was here, but a lot of the work was done so that in a fairly short period of time, months uh, after the uh, efforts to repeal the Affordable Care Act failed, they teed this thing up and passed it. Not a single Democratic vote, which is why as we approach looking at these expiring provisions, uh, you know, we've got a lot of work to do if there's any kind of uh, bipartisan uh, elements required in light of how the election turns out. But one final thing, and I'll toss it to Joe. Uh, three centers of power, White House, House, Senate. We actually face a situation, we're going to talk about it in a later slide as well, where all three, the political alignment of all of each of those three centers could turn over. Very foreseeably, you could see a Republican president you can see a Republican Senate displacing the narrow Senate Democrat majority to, to, the, to the Republican majority. And Democrats 
succeeding in, in replacing a rather what's been a kind of a dysfunctional House Republican majority, they come in. So all three new new chambers of, of power, but on the other hand, very much divided power, which is going to put the task in front of us to be a, a quite a quite an ordeal indeed. Joe. Yeah, thanks, Earl. I you know I think what you're you were getting at too is is sort of we're we're now dealing with the long term consequences and the uncertainty created by legislating using uh, reconciliation. Right? You see this perfect storm come come to be, and this is something that both parties are guilty of. And so we're seeing all these dates come crashing down. You know, we're we're calling this the Super Bowl of tax, right? But uh, other practitioners are calling it tax Armageddon, right? Because we're seeing the sort of catastrophic effects and uncertainty created by uh, not legislating for the long term, doing it all for the short term, trying to put those political wins on the board. Uh, the the other thing I think is most striking about this is just the sheer volume of policies that need to be addressed. Ultimately, you know, one or two of these would be a tall order for Congress to accomplish, right? Let alone a whole host of expiring tax provisions, funding the government, putting in place an acceptable debt ceiling. You know, Congress isn't the most functional place on earth. And I, I think that may even get worse. And, I, and we'll get into this as, as our presentation continues, but it really has a lot of work ahead of it. And so there are probably more questions than answers at this point, but looking forward to exploring the nuances with you all. So why don't we launch the first polling question? And again, um, you need to answer them in order to qualify for CPE. So, and while you all are answering, we'll continue on with the presentation, but who do you think will win the upcoming presidential election? Um, do you think Harris will win, Trump or a third party uh, will become president? Now, while you're answering that, you know, as we highlighted and, and Earl mentioned, there, there is this interesting election outcome, right? We can have a fully democratic controlled government. We can have a Republican controlled government. We can have this divided government. What does that all mean to us? Um, and, and really it, it's, it's a fascinating thing when it comes from a tax policy, right? It used to be that there was a great collaborative nature that happened in Congress, right? And, and so you, you would actually see bipartisan bills. The, that, has generally gone to the wayside and, and we have seen much more of a political process that's here. And so wh what does that mean? What does that do? Well, we now have to say, well, let's look at what these outcomes actually may, which outcomes may occur. And then what does it actually mean uh, from a, a policy perspective. Now, just to sort of share it, uh, our polls uh, results were within the margin of error. So um, I think our audience is in line with uh, all the other polling, but I, I guess Earl, this slide was, was something that was put together as far as all the likelihood. I, I know um, you saw this and, and I saw this and, and we had similar, but uh, I, I wanna say also different reactions. So I'll let you, uh, discuss what we see here as far as the likely outcomes and also Joe you know what you're seeing or what jumps off the page well I really like this slide because it among other things has probabilities if this uh, actually they do allow betting on uh, the, uh, the outcome of uh, an election and this this can be your guide because it's got the probabilities uh, and the first two probabilities, you know, very foreseeable. Uh, again, they have houses changing alignments. So these are consequential results, even though they're very predictable. Trump wins, Republican Senate. The, 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 a Senate cycle is determined largely by what happened six years earlier. And in 2018, Democrats had a decent night. We lost some seats, but we didn't do as badly as we thought. So we've got people in states that are hard to hang on to, Democrats that are that are hard to hang on to, and uh, and they're up and facing their music right now. Uh, so with a one vote Democratic margin, you know this this it's so see, easy to see how this is going to flip, and you're looking at races, for example, Montana, Ohio, 
uh, states that have inevitably become quite red, uh, represented by a Democrat, will they all switch out? Won't they switch out? Boy, the Democrats have quite a night to get through without get through unscathed. And so a, a Republican Senate is very highly foreseeable. And with the, with the, with the presidential being a coin flip, uh, that could go either way. I honestly couldn't have filled out that first question because I have no idea at this point in time who's going to win. Now, so you've got one outcome, high predictable with the Republican winning the presidency. Same with the Democrat winning the presidency. Uh, but you still have the underlying dynamic. House, the, the Senate is probably going to go Republican. Uh, and and, and it, it's probably, uh, uh, it's close, but odds are, in light of the dysfunction that's been evident in the House for the last two years, re Democrats feel fairly good about at least a narrow victory in the House. So those would be the two scenarios that way. Look, uh, there's a medium chance for Republican sweep, and there'll be a lot of consequences in the event that happens. Be, for the next two years, button your chin straps, they're going to be a very aggressive effort to, to achieve policy goals that are very hard to achieve unless you have consolidated government. And consolidated government comes around like once in a generation, uh, maybe a little more than that, but not much. So that that's going to be a, a, a real rip roaring if we get down to the third scenario. You know, it's, it's very hard to, it, it's not another uh, medium scenario is Republicans keep both houses of Congress. Kamala Harris is elected president. You have a standoff, you have a fight, you've got all kinds of stuff going on, but you don't have a, a, a clear path for dramatic uh, 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 embrace of Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And then the next chapter, uh, what they want to add, you'd be kind of fighting to a draw on that. Uh, and, and the other scenarios are all low to very low scenarios. So if you're a Democrat at this point in time, you're looking and saying, God dang it. Uh, you know, the most of these scenarios, we don't do very well until we get into long odds that probably aren't going to happen. Uh, so the Democrats, I would think, are feeling, well, I'm a Democrat, so I'll tell you how we're feeling. We're feeling kind of in a defensive crouch right now as the 20 days remaining to an election. This could turn out very, uh, in a very, this could be a very consequential election and not to our liking, uh, given that medium uh, scenario there in, in the red. So one thing I'd be interested, and, and I know Joe, you're you're gonna chime in with your thoughts, which is even if they had the Republican sweep, right? At least from the outsider's perspective, and it's it's beneficial when I look at the two highly likely scenarios of a Democrat in the House and a Republican uh, Senate, and and I see my co-panelists, so we set this up perfectly. But the party unity is no longer a thing. Right. I mean, obviously, the Democrats have done a better job of, you know, what's affectionately referred to as whipping their caucus as opposed to the Republicans. And so even if the Republicans do have it, or I guess and I'd be interested from Joe's perspective, is it really hang on or you really have no clue because any one member of that Republican caucus can really upset the apple cart. And we sort of seen that we've seen that in the past, both on the Democrats and the Republican side. But. I guess there's a lack of unity, at least from the outsider's perspective, that it's not even clear what they would be able to accomplish if they had the unified government. They would try to, but whether or not they would get across that line, I'm just not sure. So, Joe, what's your takeaways from this and, and any thoughts about, you know, Republican unity? Yeah, I, I think you're seeing that play out today, right? There, there was the letter by Senator Tom Tillis addressing some of the chamber dynamics, right? Uh, Senator Mike Lee had been forward leading and saying, you know, really we need to hear from these uh, potential Republican leaders, uh, you know, as as to how they intend to control the place. So I think, you know, high level looking at this chart, what jumps out at me is what's more likely than not some form of divided government, right? What's not stated on these charts, right? The most likely outcome probably in the Senate is the Senate flipping and us having a Senate that is run by a Republican not named Mitch McConnell, right? And, and that is a big departure from what we've seen for the past 20 or so years. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately, what does divided government mean? For me, that's increased risk of short-term extension, partial extension, uh, perhaps 
Congress missing the December 31, 2025 deadline altogether, you know, the political realities of the situation that these deals take time, right? And the first offer made by either side isn't going to be acceptable. And so they're going to have to iterate towards a solution. And so looking at this chart, my take, my, my key takeaway is this process is going to take a lot longer than anyone's letting on. And it could unfortunately slip even into 2026. I'm keying off of what each of you have said. When Joe sees a prospect for divided government, that's also true uh, along the line of what you mentioned, Kevin, under an all red scenario, uh, because you've got uh, you've got the Republican Party in a fundamental transition. I don't know how it's going to work out, when it's going to sort itself out, but it hasn't sorted itself out yet. You've got the establishment Republicans and the mega Republicans, and there are tax consequences from this. Establishment Republicans very much uh, uh, geared toward uh, economic growth through the conventional strategies, uh, tax strategies that assist business and, and, and allow our corporations to compete, not just here, but globally. Uh, and then you've got kind of a populism that's occurring uh, with this mega Republican group, and you don't quite know where they're going to land uh, on, on different things. The spending pressure is going to be excruciating in light of these horrifying debt scenarios that we're going to see. And you've got some element of the mega Republicans that I think will place. Uh, they're, they're not going to just go down the road with more corporate tax cuts, more corporate tax cuts. They're worrying about, uh, first of all, they want a, a host of individual tax cuts. And then they also are worrying about that deficit. So even in, in an all red situation, you've got a, a kind of a blurred deal um i i think that you're going to have i think that the speaker uh speaker johnson has has done a decent job of bringing a little uh, calming the waters a little bit in the house i i tend to think especially if the republicans retain the house he will be reelected. so we're not going to have at least that kind of a, a challenge in front of us so that's, I mean, it, that was one of the questions of, 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 do we think we might even have a, a new speaker? But, you know, if, if you went back and you, you looked at the history, I don't think you would have thought that we would have had the upending of the speakership at all. So I, I, it, it's really anyone's, anyone's guess, but, you know, let's, let's sort of turn a little bit to tax, right? And we now have the election has come and gone. Um, hopefully we have a, a, an answer of who won um, on the Sooner side and, it, and it's accepted by everyone. Um, you know, we had this lame duck session. It, it's affectionately referred to that as, you know, Congress is pretty much, we know where things are. Uh, you have a ticking time bomb as far as you're either out or you've been renewed as far as your seats, but you have a short window to get things done where do we have to look and where do we look, right? As far as what can they do? We have the rising debt, you know, raising the debt limit. We have funding the government, you know, presumably they might pass some uh, another short term as opposed to a long term here, even though many people have suggested long term is the, the route to go. You still have all these fun TCGA provisions, 174, 163J, 168K, you know, Joe, what do you think can get done, right? I mean, does it matter what the election outcomes are as to a lame duck, or do you think the lame duck is going to be the lame duck, and what does that look like? Yeah, you know, it's it's a very tough question to answer because I think what is most likely is nothing, right? Chances are that based on the election outcome, one side is going to feel that it can get a better deal sometime next year, right? And so ultimately, there's going to be little incentive for them, that side, to, to cut a deal. That said, from a purely tactical position, you would think that there are enough Democrats and Republicans that understand the scoring realities of extending uh research, immediate research expensing, uh, the uh, EBIT, uh, moving back to EBITDA, uh, you know, putting in a 100% bonus. They understand that 
those policies cost a lot of money, yet they're not politically controversial in the same way as that some of these other policies are. And so you would think if you were you were approaching this problem logically, you'd say, hey, let's clear the decks. Let's let's enact uh, you know the Wyden Smith tax proposal in some form. Let's uh, reset the decks and get it so we have a number, a more acceptable number to work with. But I just don't see that being likely. And I think what is more likely is that we find ourselves in a position where not much is happening. And, and, and most likely, Senate Republicans are feeling as though early next year they can get a way better deal. And I think that's a lot of what we saw play out this past year with respect to the provisions we just discussed, that, that they ultimately felt like when they had the pen in their hands, they were going to be able to, to deliver a better outcome. I have to agree. Uh, the uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fool's game to think we're going to do much better in the new year when we got all these new seats, so let's not do anything. Well, then you get into the new year, you've got the new president, you've got the new agenda, you've got everything going on, and you've got all the work you brought over that you didn't get done in December. So it's a terribly difficult legislative challenge. And one of the things I don't think Congress understands at all is the challenge facing you as practitioners trying to do some tax planning and strategies with your clients when you have very little idea about what what's going to happen next. Now, again, I mentioned uh, the corporate side of the tax. Those are mostly permanent, but there are some very popular uh, uh, personal ones, individual ones that are expiring in 25, and they're going to fund by changing some of the corporate tax uh, to, to make that work out. So nothing is safe going into the new year. It would sure be nice to find areas R&D expense. Can't we just take some of the things off the table? I, I, I've seen a very productive uh, uh, lame duck, and that was uh, in 2010. I lost my seat that year. 63 Democrats lost their seat in the House. And you'd think that there would be never a worse time to do something. Well. We all knew that these tax provisions were expiring and something had to be done. And, you know, 2010, 2012, it was 2010 that mostly kicked them down the road two years and then made them permanent at the end of 2012. You can achieve something important in lame duck, but it's not the odds bet, as Joe has mentioned. Well, and if I can add one more thing, uh, not to delay the polling question, which I know everyone's dying to get to, I think especially on the individual side, and this is it sort of tees up our, our, our next discussion, without action, households of all incomes are gonna see their taxes go up, right? And that, that's not an outcome that either side of the aisle wants to see, especially within certain income bands. So the consequences of not acting are grave. And with that, Kevin, polling question time. Let, let, yeah, let's launch uh, the second polling question as far as what do people think the outlet, out likely outcome will be uh, on the congressional elections. Will it be a clean sweep either way? Will the Democrats win the House and the Republican win the Senate or the Democrats win the Senate or the Republicans win the House? Um, you know, as as uh, Joe nicely provided the, the segue, you know, in thinking through what are the implications, right? We, we do have that springing provision, right? In, in 2026, you know, individual income tax rates automatically get adjusted. What seems clear is we have a divergent path as to who or what the two presidential candidates want to do uh, and, and attack. And, and, you know, Trump has been sort of the party line of, I want to make TCJ permanent. Um, now it's sort of interesting as, as noted before, um, one of the reasons they weren't able to do that was the cost in using reconciliation. So it, it seems like that may only be a possible scenario if they had the clean sweep of, of the Republicans um, to be able to accomplish that. Otherwise, chances are, um, I think many people are anticipating that it's going to be another reconciliation bill as opposed to a highly bipartisan bill. Um, and so query what that does. Harris, on the other hand, has been highlighting, okay, I want to make sure that anyone that earns less than 400,000 doesn't see a tax increase. And so I'm only going after who she's viewing as the high net worth individuals, which is people that um, 
are, are greater than 400,000. Now, just to sort of give the, the two polling results, um, when we combine them, not trying to, to skew anything, the, the audience outcome is uh, Harris being president and the Democrats controlling the House and the Republicans having the, the Senate. So the, the true switching of, uh, of, of Congress and, and the Democrats um, barely maintaining a, a presidency. Um, but again, all within margin of error, so take it for, for what it's worth. When you look at this and you, you look at, okay, what's happening on the individual side and the fund manager side, there's, there's several interesting things that, at least from my perspective and my practice and what I hear about um, people talking about. Obviously, Harris uh, came out with an unrealized capital gain tax that landed um, like a lead balloon uh, and then some. Now, there is this minimum tax for high net worth people that, that was proposed. Um, people focus, at least in the private equity space, on carried interest. And when you look at carried interest, it's actually really interesting. Many people are, are sort of surprised by this line where obviously Harris is saying, OK, well, if you earn more than 400,000, I'm taxing at an income tax rates. But, you know, Trump's view, at least historically from 2017, was he wanted to tax all carry at ordinary income rates, irrespective of, of what your income was. Um, now, he hasn't spoken about it recently, but a lot of the things that have been going on have been, OK, I'm either going to test the market and see how people react or I'm not even going to. Um, come out with a true high policy, it's going to be a, I'm not the other person. Uh, and, and so when you start thinking from, you know, uh, at least Earl, as you are highlighting, like, what are we supposed to do from a practitioner planning standpoint? We don't even know what all of the people think about, like, as far as like what Trump's policies are, it doesn't, we, we don't even know. Uh, we didn't know when he was president. We don't know what he is as a candidate. Um, Harris has said some things and, and mind you, she's walked back some things. And so as opposed to being like, this is what I stand for. It's like, this is where we are. So what do we say? Like we, we have salt on here, you know, the state and local, we have carried interest. We have 199 cap a, which is always a, a big thing that, that people look at. What should individual investors or, or fund managers even know, knowing that on top of all of this, right, we have the 2026 springing horizon that everyone agrees something needs to be done what that something will be done who knows because you know as we said with tcga they were never going to enact 174 like the changes to r d were never going to happen well guess what we've been now having several virtual coffee talks about 174 and how we have to apply it and how we have to you know report it oh and now we said okay we had to do corporate alternative minimum tax and we're never going to have to do it well guess what we did it because they didn't adopt pillar two, but we'll adopt pillar two and we never have to. Well, now we're struggling with the proposed regulations. What do people do? What, what should we know, Earl, as, as from an individual standpoint, right? What, where do we look from a Harris-Trump debate of, of likely outcomes? Well, left to its own devices, I think Congress will be fairly predictable along with what your audience might think is uh, well, this, yeah, we could probably give a little here. We could probably take there. And I don't, that's bad. That's a bad idea. Steer away from there. And normally that's kind of how it would function. But the, it's, we're not in a normal circumstance. One of the uh, bars on an earlier slide showed debt limit. Uh, you know, the, there is a, a, a debt limit in our country. It'd be better if we didn't have a debt limit, but we do. And it has to be confronted. Uh, and, 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 and at some point, people are going to worry about whether or not we're losing uh, the, the role that the United States has had and must never give up in terms of being basically the, the, the safe haven for investment for global wealth. Uh, yet we, we're, you know, if, if our financial situation, uh, I one time had a meeting with Japanese political subdivision leaders, and they were. This was in the late '90s. They were terribly worried about where they were going to make their investments if we didn't have bonds available because we had a balanced budget. <laughs> well, they don't have to lose any sleep on that one ever again. Uh, but the uh, uh, there are these outside, excruciatingly tough 
macroeconomic issues that do come into bear and they can blow a reasonable tax code all to hell because you just have to somehow come up with a budget number that 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 will work and so that's why i, I think what you even in republican control you might think okay well thank god they're gonna, we're gonna be all right i think our financial situation as a country is so dire that it's pretty unpredictable and and and, and there is no safe corner it, it, other than really popular individual tax measures so that leaves it all on this business front quite exposed i think but, but i guess joe from from your perspective right the republicans used to or most recently was the party that held themselves out as the deficit hawks but it's been quite clear from the policies that that have been proposed that um that may not be the case so so from the republican side what what do we think you know are they really going to care about the associated costs? Are they just going to say, okay, we want to just effectuate our policy and we'll deal with the consequences down the road? Yeah, we're reaching a, a point in the presidential election cycle where it, it feels a bit like one of Oprah's iconic giveaways, right? But instead of cars, everyone's receiving their favorite tax policy. But unfortunately, looking at this list, it, it, you know, we still don't have a lot of clarity on ultimately how investors and fund managers may be affected. I think most of these are going to be non-starters for Republicans, uh, at least the Harris proposals. And so looking at it, you know, what what is the most likely outcome to the extent there there isn't bipartisan agreement on an increased NIT or uh, higher long-term capital gains or a min tax, that's probably just a return of the top marginal rate to 39.6%. Interestingly, you've seen Trump makes some forward leading statements on the salt cap, right, which are, are is, is somewhat unexpected. Uh, is that an area where there might be some, some room to play ball? Perhaps only time will tell. And I think uh, another uh, interesting story that's developing here uh, on 199A is I think House Democrats especially are starting to see the importance of that provision in their districts. They're starting to understand it, it better and they're, they're not viewing it solely as a Republican ask or a Republican problem. If it lapses, right, they're gonna need to find uh, a way to accommodate taxpayers in their districts and, and not just small taxpayers, but medium or even large pass-throughs that are competing against traditional C-Corps, right? The TCJA was touted as this, this great piece of legislation to address international competitiveness, right? But what, what ultimately a lot of these folks are asking today is, what should we be doing with an eye towards domestic competitiveness? And, and how should we be looking at these situations where wholly domestic C-Corps are competing against pass-through entities? On carried interest, just an anecdote I'll throw out. I'm very interested to see how this provision will play out. During TCJ, you had people like Senator Pat Toomey, right? A great champion of private equity and hedge funds. You don't have those people in the Senate anymore. And to your earlier point, the tone has changed so dramatically that Republicans don't clearly align with each other on issues of, of business taxation. And so if, if you see, you, if we're, if we're going to take Trump's previous statements as true, if carried interest is, is perhaps taxed at ordinary income rates, I could very well see a deal being cut between some of these more populist Republicans and Democrats on the Harris proposal, for example, right? Which could be an interesting development, one you would not have seen even just a few years ago. But then what happens is those people that would otherwise be entitled to carry, right, will just renegotiate and say, we're not getting carried interest, we're just getting tips because both sides have said tip income is, uh, okay, so I, I, I made the exactly. joke. Exactly, that, no, that's good. And that's why, you know, ultimately <laughs> carried interest, I mean, people are fond of calling it the paper tiger, right? And ultimately people are gonna design around that, plan around it. Sorry, Earl, I stepped on whatever you were saying. Oh, well, no, I, I think they were like doing an auction. Who could, who could throw out more uh, uh, tax cuts, uh, you know, tips? Social Security checks, uh, what have you? There were several. Um, now they didn't. Harris didn't exactly keep pace, probably because of the uh, unrealized cap gains and some of the other ideas she's had that are, you know, dead on arrival. But her, she loses about three trillion dollars, and Trump loses about six point five trillion dollars. Uh, so the, no one's 
coming up even. No one's coming up with slight losses. They're, they're each in the multi-trillion dollars of loss. Uh, and in the end, uh, that and that's largely to accommodate individual tax cuts, which are where the politics are. One of the things I've seen, and it's pretty weird, the bigger the debt picture of our country, the less it matters is a political issue. Now, you might think that's just crazy talk, but I was elected in 1992. And we really cared about but the deficits. We were, both sides were, now, I guess in retrospect, I never got much political credit for the difficult votes I cast on, on trying to, on fiscal sanity, but they don't even, they're not even trying anymore. We're over $30 trillion national debt. We're about to exceed 100% GDP in national debt. We're about to have a higher percentage of national debt than we had coming out of World War II. And what are you hearing in the election? Crickets. Nobody cares. So we're in a dangerous time in our country. Uh, in the end, we, we've got to have a revenue base that somewhat matches what we spend. Uh, and, and it's going to take an awful lot of work to get there. And, and, and you practitioners are going to be in the front line of that one. Well, I, I, you know, this is this is one area, though, like turning to corporations and multinationals where we start seeing a true divergence of we haven't seen giveaways. Right. In the sense of the, the Democrats and Harris have has towed the line of saying we believe that the TCGA rate is too low. We're, we're planning to increase it now. It's not back to the higher rate, um, but we are planning to increase it up to 28 percent. We have the corporate alternative minimum tax that we would increase up to 21%. Um, and you have the excise tax that passed on, on the stock repurchases. Now on the Trump side, you could see, okay, well, we further want to reduce the rate. Um, now, one thing that's noted here, and we'll discuss it a little bit more on the next slide is there was even a reduced rate for tax, uh, for corporations that only manufacture products in the United States which then only raises, as I'm sure everyone knows oh too well, what does it mean to slap that sticker on of made in the United States? Is it all products in the United States? Can the products be overseas and you turn the last widget or the last screw and that's made in the United States? So a lot of that will have to be, you know, figured out. But just to note, again, as, as, as both Earl and, and Joe said, the focus of trying, and particularly Joe, of like the Republicans saying we're trying to drive things in the United States, like this is a true, like, if you're seeing it, you could see this um, statement uh, by Trump. Now, when you pair that with the increased use of tariffs, like this only furthers that, that driving point, right? Where Harris has really not said, okay, we're looking to increase tariffs, but Trump is saying, hey, I'm looking at doing 10 to 20%, and then, oh, by the way, 60% for China. And, that in of itself is just interesting because when you think about who has most of the U.S.'s paper, um, that relationship is rather sensitive. And you're going to say, OK, they have most of the U.S. paper, but oh, by the way, we're now going to smack that, their products with 60 percent. And you do not think that that's going to set off a trade war. And, and so um, I'll leave it for, for, for Joe first to respond and, and, and whatnot. But you could see here what the overarching picture is, right? In the sense of um, Harris is, is looking to really try to focus on companies. Now the Trump has not said anything. This is really the TCGA type proposals, whether or not this really makes sense um, in line with what he said overarching of like, we're trying to reduce in how, you know, US, but not reduce it overseas. Does he want to keep uh, or increase the rates associated with guilty? And, and you know, what does he want to do with the but Joe, what, what do we think? What do we think multinationals should know looking at the Harris versus Trump dynamic of, of sort? I think the most important thing to keep in mind is ultimately, it seems unlikely that the US is gonna remain a part or fully compliant with the OCD agreement, right? And so ultimately, it is important to, to game out scenarios where we are non-compliant. And what does that mean ultimately for your, your bottom line? I, I, you know, there's a, a growing, irrespective of, of whether or not corporations are paying their fair share. I, and in light of the fiscal concerns we, we have uh, just discussed, there's a growing recognition that the U.S. desperately needs this tax revenue, right? And so at the end of the day, uh, 
you know, does it make sense for 70% of the, the profits to be reallocated or that are reallocated under pillar one to, to come from US based companies, right? Does it make sense for the US on a net basis to, to lose 120 billion under pillar two? You know, these are, these are estimates being presented by the joint committee on, on taxation and a nonpartisan entity, the official scorekeeper, the, the person who's supposed to be calling the, the balls and strikes on Capitol Hill, right? And, and so recognizing this dire fiscal situation where we're also biting on a certain level the hand that feeds us, right, by going after the country that is buying a lot of our debt, are we setting ourselves up for success? And how do we operate in this environment where chances are there are going to be additional distortions in the competitive landscape. Maybe that's the polite way of saying it, right? We're going to have all these distortions and ultimately uh, there are limits on, on sort of what our corporate taxes can accomplish, right? And, and so I, I think it'll be a, a very interesting situation to see play out. But it is interesting just to note, right? The one, the, the, the one agency that brings money into the United States, right? The, the IRS, is the agency that always gets the short end of the stick when it comes to funding, right? And so irrespective of whether or not you think that there were bad political actors or um, they are not able to manage the money uh, effectively, um, no funding them, uh, while that might be favorable for, for some, uh, but at the same point you're thinking, if we don't give them any money, there's no enforcement, and so there's no money to come in, right? And so there's this interesting dynamic that we just haven't seen Congress recognize. They want to keep banging the political drum, but um, I guess Earl, since since uh, I'm trying to make sure we have opportunities for you to to share your thoughts on this, while also um, touching on on other political items, I'm going to launch the next poll, but then I want you to be able to then comment on what we should see from the multinational. So. Really quickly, um, we're looking ahead. Uh, not Your votes matter, not only for the election, but also for virtual coffee talk. So what topic would you like covered in the next virtual coffee talk? Um, the recently released corporate alternative minimum tax regulations, a post-election follow-up, which hopefully uh, Earl and Joe would be willing to, to share their thoughts, international tax hot topics or partnership hot tax topics. But Earl, while they're answering, what should we know? What should, from a Democratic side, what are we thinking that um, multinationals should be aware of? Um, I think the American public needs to be aware that our economy performing rather fabulously at this moment. Now, the politicians can't say that because people are mad about their milk and their eggs and the, the you know kind of cost of micro micro impact on costs, but as a macro evaluation, the economy is doing quite well based on global integration. Now, each party seems to have an agreement on what should be the foundation of their, their tax and trade policy going forward, and it's tariffs. Uh, tariffs and withdrawal, uh, exactly opposite to what has, in my opinion, played a big role in creating the kind of economic uh, productivity that we're having. And so, what I would think we can really use from your listeners is you know, members need counsel. They don't need talking points. They need counsel in terms of, well, you may think that uh, pillar two is just a, is, is something that that's a Democrat deal. Republicans can't stand it. But on the other hand, uh, taking uh, departing from OECD's uh, 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 consolidated approach, has got serious downsides as well. So, what I what I really could what I what I would like if I were still a member is technical information that helps me evaluate where the talking points are just garbage in terms of actual substantive impact. And, and believe me, I, I'm talking about talking points on both sides, uh, and and help us have a more informed tax and trade policy. So we don't we don't screw things up. I think that looking at either side, you 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 can have some apprehension that this is not going to work out that well in the new year, uh, given some of the things being said on the stump right now. It's definitely going to be interesting. And 
you could see on this slide, we have, you know, other items of potential interest and, you know, we have tax reform, obviously, because, you know, we're all tax geeks, but you could see the economy, inflation, border security, reproductive rights. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And, and it, it, it's scary just to think back to, you know, what both you and Joe said as far as what Congress has to address or what they may be addressing. Um, it, it's an inordinate list and it's, it's just absolutely, um, in many ways, it feels insurmountable from someone that hasn't been there and then hearing from people that have been there that it's insurmountable. Um, it's 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 a little bit uh it's going to be a wild ride um in in the last uh minute or two before nate chose us answer connect um i did want to highlight one interesting uh thing that we also need to be mindful of which is the regulatory landscape you know there there is this fun provision called the congressional review act in which congress can go and actually review um recently uh, enacted regulations. Now, anytime that there's a change in party, they always uh, look at, at what was most recently able to be challenged. Both sides do it. So it's not a, I don't want to say it's not political, but it's not a um, one side does it versus the other. Uh, and so anything that's currently going to be finalized uh, is subject, is going to be subject to it. It's based off of a time deadline, which looks at congressional calendars. And everyone is comfortable at this point that anything that's finalized can be subject to it. On top of that, you have the regulatory pressures of Loper Bright and Corner Post, which enables people to actually challenge regulations that have come out, even old and cold regulations under cold Corner Post. Loper Bright is, has raised a lot of fascinating questions um, as to did this exceed authority, what level of deference, and you can already see on this slide, there's a host of cases already that are just challenging regulations. And this is not necessarily some of the new regulations, right? I mean, we have 245 Cap A and we have the 965 transition tax, but looking at 482, uh, that's that's an old and cold. And, and many people have always said, okay, well, maybe we should look to challenge it. So stay tuned for these thoughts uh, as we're gonna be seeing not only an election implications, we're gonna see what happens at the agency level and what happens at treasury. And in light of Loper Bright, you know, when I was at the IRS, it was really big of the IRS and treasury always ask for reg authority. And historically the Republicans didn't wanna give as much reg authority. And now in light of Loper Bright, if they don't give reg authority, it's gonna be quite limited as to the implications. Um, so stay tuned for that. But I guess Nate, what should people know from a CCH Answer Connect now that we've given them all this uh, interesting data of we don't know what's going to happen, but we're looking forward to seeing what happens in less than a month? You're, you're on mute, but we see your Answer Connect. I'll use the moment to say one more Now you can hear me coming through. Members of Congress really can use your, your, your technically deep counsel on when they're really going to do some harm that they don't understand at all. Uh, so well, be involved. That's what I, I would say. And, and I'm, I'm out now. Th thank you very much. Thanks, Earl. Thank you. Thanks, Earl. Appreciate that. And thank you, Kevin. Again, appreciate the opportunity to come here and talk about CCH Answer Connect and how it can kind of help practitioners kind of do their best to kind of navigate this very uncertain future that we're, that we're coming into um, here as we could just kind of come into a natural time of change in this country. So. The first thing that I would start off with is um, inside of Answer Connect, one of the areas that we um, that really helps practitioners, especially this time of year, to understand what's going on, is to take a look at some of our tax tools. And in particular, I want to draw attention to the tax tools that we have specifically around expiring tax provisions. So I'm in Answer Connect. I'm on our federal tax area. I went into our tax tools, and inside of tax tools, you can see that we have three different expiring tax um, smart charts that are out there. Uh, ones, and I'll go ahead and open up all three of these, and we'll take a look at them um, kind of individually. But inside of each one of these federal tax provision areas, you can go through and you can take a look at all these different, um, you can take a look at those expiring provisions in one of three ways. One of the ways is by looking at it through basically the, the topic area in which something's expiring. So these are the different topics that, that are out there. You also can view those same expiring provisions specifically by code section and the code section that contains the expiring provisions 
And then the one that I kind of find to be the most helpful as you're a practitioner is actually to take a look at the expiring tax provisions by the tax year in which they are going to expire. So it's very easy to come into Answer Connect, go into one of these tax tools, select all of the different years that contain um, expiring tax provisions, or you can pick and choose just one, depending on what you're looking to do. And then with the click of just a couple of buttons, you can get into a full list of which tax provisions are expiring in which year. And as you can see, um, if we go into 2024, there's a variety of provisions that are going to be expiring at the end of 2024 that may create tax planning opportunities that you might want to take advantage of now before these provisions expire so that you don't have to roll the dice on whether or not these are going to be extended in the new Congress when that comes in, since there's a fair degree of uncertainty around what those are going to be. And again, you can project these out not just into 2024, but also out into 2026 and 2027. Um, that's when a lot of, I believe, the um, additional bonus depreciation, that first year um, bonus depreciation or accelerated depreciation starts to fully expire. So you can really go through very quickly, very easily and see exactly when are these code sections going to be expiring. Um, and then if, again, if you wanted to take a look at that through the lens of which code sections are going to be expiring, or if you're just curious about a particular topic and you want to see you know, what's going to be expiring based on a topic, you can very easily also select those items you're looking for and then view the results to see um, kind of that same information all over again. So that expiring tax provisions tool in here, very, very helpful for you as you're kind of coming up on that year-end tax planning um, meeting that you often have with a lot of your clients to make sure that you're looking at all of these expiring provisions and then doing the necessary tax planning around them to take advantage of them while they're still um, in effect instead of waiting for those opportunities to potentially be extended or maybe not extended in the future. And then the other item that I would say that's going to help you is you're just kind of trying to stay on top of what's going on in Answer Connect is we have what I would describe as the, the best editorial bench in the business that's just constantly looking at what's changing um, in the world of federal tax, state tax, international tax, and audit and accounting on a daily basis. So I would say, especially during these times where there's a lot of things going on in the news, a really powerful tool to help you stay up to date is to sign up for the um, email newsletters that we have so that you can get updates pushed straight to you as they happen instead of having to come in, remember to come in here and do the research on your own. So I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about the, um, the, the different newsletter configuration options that we have inside of Answer Connect. So it's very easy once you're logged in to go into your email news settings and basically say, hey, where do you want to um, get this information and what do you want to be updated on? The CCH Client Impact um, email newsletter um, allows us to basically take a look at all of the, the rules that are changing and then talk about how that applies to your specific client set if you're using the CCH Access Tax product line as well. So it helps you kind of sift through the noise to figure out um, which expiring provisions or which news items are going to apply specifically to your client base. So that's a really powerful one. Um, you also can choose different federal briefings. We have a, um, a, a federal tax briefing that the Walters Kluwer or the CCH team writes on a regular basis that you can sign up for, or if there are specific um, federal tax areas that you want to stay up to date on. Um, you can choose to either update all of these news areas or you can um, choose, pick and choose which different topics you want to stay up to date on. And you also can choose different custom search terms. So if you wanted to know what was going on with, say, bonus depreciation, you can just basically put that um, keyword phrase in and then any news article that we publish that talks about what's going on with bonus depreciation, um, you can have that added. Um, added to your news alerts and anytime that that particular search phrase comes up inside of a news article you'd be alerted to it. Um, similar thing going on at the state level obviously this was primarily a federal conversation but all those same capabilities exist um, at the state level as well so if you wanted to stay up to date on what's going on any of the states inside of the, the USA you can do that also the different types of tax and you have that custom search capability in here as well. At the international level, same type of thing. If you're curious to stay on top of what's going on with BEPS um, or any of the other you know, topic areas in international tax, you can choose those. If there's a specific country that you care about, staying up to date on what's going on between with, with that country and its um, tax relationship with the United States or any other country, you can do that in here as well. Um, and then we also have some good auditing and accounting content that you can stay up to date on um, to stay up to date on what's going on with uh, the FASB um, and then the SEC in terms of what types of audited and accounting standards are they setting for public and private companies. So those are the two features in Answer Connect that I wanted to hit on today. So again, just to recap those real quickly in the last minute that we have here. The first one of those is going to be taking a look at our expiring tax provision smart charts that you see over here. And then the second one of those 
is going to be to sign up for our email newsletters to make sure that you're staying up to date with um, what's happening as we're going into kind of the end of the year here. So that's what I had for you today. Um, Margaret, if you want to go ahead and, and bring it home, I think we're um, all set with my content. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. That wraps up today's webinar. I want to thank everyone who participated and I want to thank our speakers and Nate as well for some great insight. Um, as a reminder, CPE credit will be posted within two to four business days. You will receive an email with a link to the course evaluation and your certificate of completion. This webinar was also recorded and you will receive an email with the access to the recording within 24 hours. I'm going to launch that final poll right now. Um, again, we thank you all for attending and I hope you have a good day.